Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for another VES Artex Academy webinar. Today, we are joined by Dr. Nigel Cook of the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Dairyland Initiative. And he's going to be talking to us today about designing a robot milking herd to promote efficiency, productivity, health, and well-being. We are very much looking forward to the presentation today. Um, before Dr. Cook gets started, I just want to touch on a brief housekeeping item. If you have any questions throughout the presentation today, um, please type them in the Q&A um, panel on your screen, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Um, and with that, uh, Dr. Cook, the floor is yours. Well, thank you much. I uh, appreciate uh, Annie and Karen organizing these uh, webinars. Uh, I think this might be my fourth time I'm doing this. It's been one of the highlights of the pandemic for uh, for us. And uh, just fresh off our Dairyland Initiative workshops, which uh, VSR Techs uh, sponsored our breaks yesterday. So very much appreciate it. And thank you for joining us today to talk a little bit about optimizing design and management uh, of these uh, automated milking systems that are uh, really challenging the way we think, I think, in terms of what we know about conventional herds. Um, we've learned a little bit uh, as our dairy industry in Wisconsin has uh, uh, adopted this technology. Uh, and we visited uh, a group of AMS herds uh, around the summer of 2018, herds that have been in, for, uh, for the most part, running around four years, um, averaged around 200 cows, um, majority new uh, designs. Uh, and had the fairly typical breakdown of uh, robot manufacturers. And really what we've been doing, we're trying to be independent of uh, the manufacturers of uh, the robotics, assuming that each of them do a pretty good job of uh, producing products that get teat cups on teats and do a great job of robotic milking. What we're talking about here today is really the design of the unit, the AMS unit itself. And really, we have seen a, a somewhat uptick, an improvement in overall production of these uh, herds over recent years. Uh, this group uh, of dairies were averaging around 85 pounds or 39 kilos and 2.8 milkings per day, uh, which is getting to the point where um, we're uh, of, of respectability. And uh, obviously, I think these herds are learning and we're learning from them. Equally north of the border, our friends in Canada, um, this is a group of researchers just completed uh, a study of almost 200 AMS units, and this is just published uh, last month, uh, again, averaging a pretty respectable 81 pounds of milk per cow per day. Uh, and these, uh, this group um, published this study looking at the factors associated with higher milk production. So throughout this talk, uh, I'll refer to the findings of our, uh, of our work, but also uh, their work uh, north of the border. So before I get into the things that I think are important for the design of AMS units, perhaps I can ask the question of what you guys think is important. So what aspects of design do you think deserves the highest priority? And you've got uh, five choices. So let us know. We'll give it just a few more seconds for people to get their answers in. So we have 47% of people saying the traffic flow system, 14% feed access, 5% heifer transition, 20% lameness management, and 13% comfy stalls. Pretty good. We, we did this yesterday and actually got pretty similar results. So uh, fascinating stuff. Thank you for, for giving us that information. And I'm going to get into our blueprint. This is, uh, you know, we avoid trying to design and, you know, give you a sort of a picture of what a perfect dairy looks like. Rather, we want to give you a series of points uh, to follow, a sort of blueprint, a map uh, that you can sort of tick off and adapt to uh, different producers' um, emphasis and uh, uh, points that they value more than others. But these, these are the things that we've come up with, not only uh, through our Dairyland Initiative program, but also our friends over in Finland. Uh, give a shout out to them, the 4D Barn Group. And if you want to go to their website, 4dbarn.com, they'll uh, 
uh, you'll be able to find some of the services and uh, skill sets that they have to offer. We've learned a lot from them. So this is our blueprint. Let's, uh, let's get into it and sort of tick each one of these off and have a brief discussion. Uh, it's going to need me to give you a little bit of terminology before we get into that, uh, just in terms of the way we call different designs. So we call side layouts where the, uh, the robot is located on the side of the barn parallel to the feed bunk here. We call a crossway where the robot is perpendicular to the feed lane, typically at the end of a pen uh, with a, a secondary pen behind that, uh, that robot. So that's a crossway. An L shape is a combination of both a side and a crossway. So you get both in the shape of an L and they can be laid out uh, as head to head with the cows facing each other or head to tail with the cows pointing uh, towards, typically towards the feed bunk. And then a toll booth is a, an arrangement uh, really laid out like you're paying a toll driving down the freeway where cows come into the robot here and then exit behind the robot and back around. Um, and uh, there are some slight variations of that layout we'll come on to in a moment. So the first uh, element of our blueprint is to ask for 55 cows per robot and a minim uh, minimum two AMS units per pen. Let's go into that. Well, there's this thing called theor theoretical robot capacity. Typically wash the robot uh, for about two hours a day, leaving you 22 hours of uh, robot availability for the cows at an average box time of around seven minutes. Uh, that equates to a milking around eight cows per hour, uh, which is 176 milkings per day with those 22 hours. And at our average 2.8 milkings per day that we were seeing, it equates to around 63 cows per robot, which is fairly commonly seen. I think we averaged around 60 cows in our survey. If uh, we develop better robots and we can minimize this box time, let's say we can average six minutes instead of seven, then you can start to get these uh, uh, numbers of cows per robot that we frequently hear about in the industry, sort of touching 70 or even 80 cows per robot. But I think that kind of math forgets that we are not dealing with robots when we're talking about cows and that cows are cows. And this is data from a free flow dairy, uh, free flow designed uh, AMS unit, just looking at uh, non-milking and milking visits throughout 24 hours. And this one was averaged over a two day period. And what you can see with this graphic is that the desire to be milked by the cows isn't a, a uniform constant at uh, uh, seven or eight cows milked per hour throughout the day. There are periods two o'clock in the morning with very little activity around the robot. There are other periods, you know, typically early morning, later afternoon, and uh, just really uh, at uh, bar closing time when cows are just ready for uh, getting ready for bed, they uh, have some intense activity around, around the robot here. And you can drive that activity with fetching times. You can see that done here in this dairy. And obviously you can artificially reduce activity by uh, these wash up periods that you see here and here. But the desire to be milked isn't constant. That's really what I want to send, uh, sell here. And so there's, although there's no real threshold for cows per robot that we can point to in the literature, um, it's unlikely that we can achieve these very high numbers that we can th theoretically achieve uh, with better uh, operation of the robot and, uh, and prompt a unit attachment. Those are good things in themselves, but we still have to accommodate the cows and greater numbers of cows per robot will decrease visits in our data sets uh, increase fetch rates. That's been shown multiple times. Uh, and so just remember, cows aren't robots. And I think we should be designing closer to around 55 cows per robot uh, than 60, 70, or even 80. There's a little bit of data. Uh, this was Marlene Tremblay's work um, looking at uh, red robots, uh, over 500 of them, um, and finding more milk per robot with more than one robot per pen in that data set. And that makes somewhat sense. And uh, there's some preference there for us to have two or more robots uh, in a pen. It allows you to do some maintenance, it gives you some flexibility, it gives the cows some choice, uh, and um, there's greater chance of robot access for subordinate cows, uh, a topic, again, we'll come on to in a little bit. 
So that's point one. Point two is an old friend of mine, uh, deep loose bedding. And uh, we're obviously big proponents of sand. And uh, historically, sand has been a little bit scary for the robot manufacturers. Um, in terms of the design, it does preclude a lot of slatted floors, and that's no bad thing if we're trying to reduce lameness rates. Uh, it does require some adaptation to scraper systems, making sure you have a collapsing V to allow bedding access equipment to drive in, because uh, we need to be very efficient in the way we deliver bedding in this type of scenario. And there are some tweaks uh, with each of the, um, the robot systems to help them uh, manage their way through increased wear with sand. But uh, in our view, fairly manageable issues that we've seen our industry conquer. Because in our survey, uh, we saw 57% of our robot dairies using sand, 24% uh, a rubber crumb type mattress, 17% water beds, and 2% manure solids, giving you about total 60% of the herds using deep, loose bedding. And those herds outperformed the others, as we've found with our conventional herds, averaging about 86 pounds for the, the deep, loose bedded herds, uh, around 79, 78 for the mattress herds. And that was very similar to what we saw in the Canadian data that I, the study I showed you there. They found a 3.3 pound a day uh, improvement uh, with the use of sand bedding compared to other bedding surfaces in their survey. So that does seem to be emerging and consistent. Moving on, uh, a minimum 24 inches or 60 centimeters of feed bunk space per cow in the main lactating pen with frequent feed push up and free access to feed. So there's quite a lot in there. Uh, let's hit on that a little bit. Two studies, both of them uh, Canadian studies showing increased milk per cow with increasing bunk space. And I just give you the mean bunk space per cow provided in those surveys. This Deming one, a smaller study around 13 herds, this one nearly 200, as you see, and they were achieving on average uh, our goal of 24 inches or 60 centimeters of bunk space. And unlike our conventional herds, which you know that typically means that we're gonna build two row pens and you can certainly build two row stall pens for uh, robot facilities, but you can achieve those numbers with three row pens in, in robots. And that's because uh, robots have these larger crossover areas uh, in front of the robot themselves, uh, and you can extend the bunk around the robot uh, room to increase bunk space. And obviously you can play around with uh, the number and uh, width of crossovers and things. So there are some layouts that lend themselves to that increased uh, bunk space uh, and uh, give you just an example of that. The, uh, the L shape here uh, because uh, you have the robot room with this extended area of crossover, you have all this extra bunk that you uh, tend not to have with a conventional herd. Uh, similarly with a toll booth, uh, again, the increased crossover and the uh, space occupied by the robot room can increase the uh, bunk space provision uh, within three row pens to get to our target. And then Matson's uh, survey data really uh, emphasize the importance of feed push-up. Uh, frequently in conventional herds, we're, we're manually pushing up feed, typically around uh, six times a day or so uh, with uh, uh, two, uh, one or two feed drops. Uh, in robot herds, with the adoption of uh, 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 pushers like this Juno device, but each, each manufacturer has its own uh, version of this, uh, we can have uh, push-up uh, occurring every hour. And uh, in this study by uh, Matson, uh, they were averaging 13 times a day. So basically every two hours, the feed was uh, being pushed up. Of course, you've got to deliver enough feed. And this uh, uh, highlights, um, you know, uh, those devices can only push up the feed that's available. And you can make a lovely little windrow of a tiny amount of feed that the cows can't reach. So feed delivery is also you know, part of the equation. Uh, so this free access to feed piece gets us into the most commonly uh, pointed out design feature that you guys, about 43% of you focused on. Uh, what flow type are, are we going to use uh, within this AMS design? And there are certainly pros and cons of free flow, guided flow, and what we're calling hybrid or semi-guided flow, which I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to define for you. Um, not a lot of data on this, but some uh, big, uh, big uh, study of uh, Lely herds, 
found that the, the free flow did indeed increase milk per cow over the guided flow, but um, uh, that manufacturer is somewhat bi uh, biased towards uh, uh, free flow and only 7% of the herds uh, had guided flow in their survey. Um, there are clearly pros and cons, and I think our, our position would be that individual farm circumstances will likely drive the decision. Um, and um, we can uh, adopt uh, both strategies successfully, um, but you will see uh, some differences, and I'll show you what we've found. The pros of a free flow system are that the cows are free to move around the pen to go to the bunk, uh, in particular when fresh feed is delivered, and we think that's really important. Uh, they can have lower cost with fewer gates um, uh, because we're not using as many sort gates, which do have a significant cost, and cows tend not to get trapped waiting for the robot in a, a commitment area, but I'll challenge that in a moment as well. On the con side, they do tend to feed more pellet in the robot uh, themselves. I'll show you some data on that. Um, operation requires a little more fetching of cows, typically about 3% more cows being fetched in our free flow versus guided flow. It does make uh, use of foot baths a little bit more challenging and placement is, uh, is really difficult. And I'll, again, we'll come on to that. Um, and it may well need more FTEs to operate. On the guided flow side, there are some advantages of guided flow, easier to manage, uh, potentially with less labor, a little bit less fetching of cows and uh, data showing less feeding of uh, pellet in the robot, all things that would be very tempting if you're a dairy producer. Um, there are some sort options that you can in, uh, build in when cows are exiting that uh, commitment area. But on the con side, a pure guided flow uh, where crossovers are closed to the feed bunk means that those cows cannot have access to fresh feed. Uh, simply, they have to go through the sort gate. And cows can get uh, trapped uh, within that commitment pen for long periods waiting to access the robot uh, unless we do something about that through alert systems and so on. You still have to fetch some of the cows. This is what we mean by hybrid or semi-guided flow. So in a pure uh, guided flow, this crossover would be closed to the cows. And the only way that the cow could access fresh feed at the bunk would be to enter the commitment area. Uh, and if they've been recently milked, they would go through the sort gate and get to the bunk. However, if, uh, if they still have permission to be milked, they have to get into the robot, be milked, then go through the sort gate to get to fresh feed. We think that's putting a cap on performance and uh, an intake. Um, good herds will obviously manage around it as good herds always do, but we don't want to put thresholds and caps on performance uh, unnecessarily. And so we've gone around with a number of guided flow herds and opened up these crossovers and turned them into this hybrid or semi-guided flow with mostly positive uh, effects. And these are the data that we uh, saw in our survey. 66% uh, 66, uh, 66 of our herds were free flow, uh, a quarter were guided flow, and 10% were hybrid. So we only had four hybrid uh, semi-guided flow herds. So emphasize that, not enough really for uh, statistics here, but we do have a significant difference between the free flow and the guided flow of the order uh, of about uh, uh, six pounds of milk. And not surprisingly, and I think you know, pretty. Uh, this would be what we would predict, although we have only a few of them, uh, the hybrids were intermediate between those two levels, which again is what we would expect. And similar to what our friends at the University of Minnesota found, um, feeding uh, rates of pellet uh, within the robot were higher in the free flow, 11.6 uh, pounds versus 8.1 pounds, with again, the hybrid herds being somewhat intermediate between the two as expected. So at least some of this extra production does come from the feeding uh, of what is usually a fairly expensive uh, pellet within the robot. Um, usually those marginal gains are worthwhile, but it's something we wanna uh, certainly examine, uh, but could also drive decision-making uh, between producers on different farms. Next stop is ventilation and cooling, something I know VSR techs are pretty passionate about providing target airspeed in the resting area and adequate air exchange. We've certainly spent a, a lot of time on this these last few years, really emphasizing the importance of, uh, of good ventilation for our dairies. And I think that's uh, increasingly important 
uh, with the design of AMS units because uh, these robot rooms do create challenges. When you put them on the side of the barn, they block the inlet in naturally ventilated facilities. Uh, when you put them in the middle of the barn, they block airflow uh, in um, uh, tunnel ventilated facilities. Um, they create challenges for the location of uh, inlets in cross ventilated barns. And uh, you've got quite a lot of technology that you also want to have some level of climate control uh, around. Uh, so these are the challenges that I think really point us towards an increased use of mechanical ventilation systems or sophisticated systems to uh, control the climate within these robotic barns. Most common issue is really the, the dead airspace that we see uh, uh, the other side of uh, one of these robots and the use of recirculation fans, just trying to uh, increase air movement in the dead area on the backside of, uh, of these robots. Uh, we also have to get somewhat creative uh, to create inlets around these robot rooms or use positive pressure fans either side to help push air uh, into these uh, dead area spaces. The importance of uh, ventilation overall uh, was really highlighted in this Canadian survey, again, 200 herds. And what they found was basically the use of any type of fan uh, compared to purely naturally ventilated barns increased milk production. And it increased it by a lot, uh, 5.7 to 9.2 pounds per day the benefit of mechanical or supplemental uh, ventilation systems over pure natural ventilation. So it's a big deal. And again, this is Canada. I mean, it does get a little warm during the summer, but it's, it's certainly not Arizona. Uh, so this is just, again, emphasizing the importance of cooling and quality air uh, in these types of facilities. I showed you this picture of a nice tunnel barn, flat ceiling, uh, fans over the stalls, um, good air exchange, good air movement where the cows are lying down, and certainly where the industry is heading uh, with different uh, concepts to improve air movement and cooling within these barns. Next stop, cows must be selected through a foot bath when uh, leaving the robot. So uh, how do we deal with lameness in robot dairies? Well, two recent surveys, um, 2016, 2018 would point towards a situation where uh, frustratingly, we seem to be going backwards with lameness management. Uh, we've moved uh, a, a lot of uh, conventional herds from around 25% uh, lameness to 10 to 15% lameness over the last 10 years, uh, almost halved the rate of lameness uh, within our conventional herds, certainly in the upper Midwest. Um, these data would suggest um, that the, our AMS units are where our conventional herds uh, were and where many herds are still uh, around the world. And that's a bit frustrating to think about when we have uh, the adoption of the most sophisticated technology available to us uh, and still fail miserably on lameness prevention. You don't want a lame cow in a robot dairy. They visit the robot uh, less frequently. They are, uh, they become the fetch cows. Uh, they're just a nuisance. And so how do we go around managing it? Well, uh, we do have a challenge related to the use of foot baths in, um, in these uh, robotic dairies. Um, we typically, on average, foot bath around four times a week in a conventional herd, and it's easy. You put the foot bath uh, in a return lane as the cows come back from the parlor. You don't get to do that in, in a robot herd, and so we see many uh, 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 foot baths located in crossovers, such as you see here. Uh, some producers complain that when they put a foot bath on the exit of the robot that it reduces robot visits, so they don't like doing that. But we, uh, we have a problem. We have some challenges here that we need to address. I believe we need to design the AMS unit so that we can select cows from the robot to walk through the foot bath when we need to. Uh, I'm uncomfortable just putting a foot bath in a location where every time the cow goes to the robot, uh, she gets foot baths because that could mean foot bathing six times a day. I'm not sure that's necessary. But equally, uh, we don't want a situation where foot baths are voluntary or just not done at all. 
So as we look at different designs, it really points us towards uh, layouts where we can uh, create that selection process. Where do we put the foot bath uh, that makes sense, where we can select animals uh, through, um, uh, through, the, through the bath as they uh, walk, walk out of the, the robot. Um, toll booth uh, layouts such as this have an exit lane behind the robot. The cows leave all of the robots in this lane and they can be selected uh, at an appropriate time into a foot bath before they rejoin uh, the lactating cow group. So we like this kind of selection process. It can also be used to select a cow for hoof trimming, which I'll mention in a moment. This island system, it's an adaptation of a, a side uh, installation where you put the robots actually in an island in the middle of the barn in a quadrant system. So here's one part of a quadrant with access to two robots here. Cows are uh, in a guided flow system. So they're entering a commitment pen, uh, being sorted uh, through a sort gate here to enter to, to get milked. But on the exit, uh, they can be uh, selected to go through a foot bath at that time before they return uh, to the main pen. So in an island system with guided flow, we can use uh, a, a selection process for foot bathing. This is an adaptation from 4D Barn of the toll booth, where the, uh, the robots are actually angled in a sort of herringbone here. And as the cows exit, uh, they can uh, eat at the feed bunk here. But to rejoin the main group, we can set up a, a barrier and a selection gate at this point uh, to direct the cows through a foot bath in this location. Or we could move this whole assembly up to this location, closing this off, and the cows could walk through a foot bath at the end here where these stalls are located before they return to the pen. So again, selecting cows into a robot drives you towards uh, certain uh, layouts where that is possible. Um, I also mentioned the, uh, the, the ability to select cows uh, that require uh, attention to their, to their hoofs. Um, we have very commonly uh, have uh, commercial hoof trimmers, pay them to visit the farm uh, once a week, once every two weeks, once a month, whatever it is, and they'll come and trim and do a great job for us, trimming 50 to 100 cows a day. For AMS units, that's incredibly disruptive to have uh, 50 or 100 cows in your unit trimmed in one day. It disrupts their pattern of, uh, of robot attendance. And it does represent that we need to rethink and perhaps go in a more one cow at a time approach uh, in AMS units, really um, training the people on the farm to be able to uh, do routine hoof care and be able to select cows out of the robot in this fashion. So I, I view a, a selection area like this with a, a trim chute really essential for the management of an AMS herd. Next stop, uh, we've got the, the fresh cow. So 24 seven fresh cow access to the robot uh, for 10 to 21 days. This is where we get a little sketchy. So um, the challenge I see in AMS units is what to do with the cow uh, after, um, uh, after calving. The vast majority of our herds, um, we've been working on transition for over 10 years. We've got dedicated facilities built for that. Uh, we know how to build far dry, pre-fresh areas, maternity areas. But it's really right at the point of calving in a robot dairy uh, where all the action is. How do we get that animal uh, to get used to attending uh, the robot? And so what we like to see and what we're strongly in favor of is at the point of calving, some setup where cows, uh, fresh cows are separate and have 24 seven free access to a robot. And that's what you see in this picture here. We're standing in the main lactating group here uh, where cows can access the, the robot. But with this flip gate, cows on this backside here uh, can attend uh, the, the robot just by pushing against the gate and coming through here. And then they can be selected back into, uh, into that pen. The question for us really then is how long do we keep cows uh, separated for in this manner? And that's where we've got our next poll question is uh, the farms, the, the AMS units that you have or you're working with, how, how long do they separate their fresh cows for from the main lactating cow group?
We'll give it about five or 10 more seconds. All right, so it looks like we have 70% saying no with 30% saying yes. Thanks, Annie. And again, that's well, that was pretty typical of our workshop as well. So we're not seeing the same approach to fresh cow management in uh, our robot dairies as we are in our conventional herds. In the vast majority of freestall house conventional dairies that we're dealing with, fresh cows are housed typically for about 21 days separate, and then they join a main lactating cow group. That's not being done very often in our robot facilities. And I'll show you some data from our survey uh, on what we saw. So typically uh, what we're seeing on average is that fresh cows and heifers uh, are separated from the ma uh, main lactating group uh, for an average of six or seven days. So that's why we chose that seven days in the poll question. So again, most people not doing that. Indeed, 38%, almost 40% of the herds really only separate the cow for one day or less. Um, so they're, they're basically, uh, we have an approach uh, where fresh cows and heifers are uh, competing with uh, other lactating cows uh, right from the get-go, right from the start. And, and that just seems like a big challenge, uh, particularly for the, the first lactation heifers to me. Um, we do have herds, a small number, but we do have herds that actually separated cows for 14 days or more. Uh, and sometimes we get arguments about, oh, well, that's, that's going to disrupt the, the cow's uh, use of the robots, and, and we don't like that idea. Well, the herds that were doing this had higher production than the herds that weren't doing it, and it certainly didn't seem to negatively impact them. So that seems to be a kind of a, a red herring uh, that we're not seeing consistent in the, uh, uh, in, in the field. Um, the question when to move, I think is really a valid one. How long do you keep the cow separate for? It probably isn't an average of 21 days in, in AMS units because you've got so much more data to look at uh, to determine when that cow is you know, successfully through transition. You've got components, you've got um, individual milks, uh, you've got a lot of data that you can look at and decide at day six or seven whether a cow is ready to move uh, and compete in the main lactating cow pen. But equally, you want some flexibility so that you can see a cow that is struggling and continues to struggle at 10 or 20 days uh, where you can continue to give them uh, the sort of special needs uh, uh, help that they need to, to make that transition successfully so they don't uh, end up as being a, a sick cow or a DA cow uh, in the, the main lactating cow group. So um, a real work in progress here where really a small faction of the AMS uh, industry is focused on uh, you know, separating fresh cows and um, uh, transitioning them in similar manner that we have done in our conventional herds. In larger herds, you can have your own fresh cow robot. Typically, it's around 600 cows. That would support a 50 cow fresh pen for about 21 to 30 days. And again, we did have one example of a, of a herd uh, doing that. Um, and, I, and again, there'll be pros and cons of managing that separate group. And then those animals adapting to those group changes uh, after around a month. But uh, from the few herds that are doing it, they don't seem to be uh, struggling negatively as a result of it. And here's that, uh, that the prime example that we had here. This is cows going through a, a fresh cow robot. This is the fresh pen here located. And once cows are through uh, that sort of 20 day period, they get moved into the, the milking pen. Um, associated with uh, transition is uh, the first lactation heifer and transitioning that heifer uh, into the main herd. So let's spend a few minutes thinking about her. Uh, these are data from, again, from our, our colleagues at University of Minnesota from their survey, um, looking at both uh, free flow and guided flow herds, recognizing that the peak ratios, the ratio of the mature cow peak to the heifer peak uh, is not where it needs to be. Typically in our conventional herds, it'll be 75 to 77%. We're seeing 71% in guided flow on average here, 74% uh, 
uh, in free flow, uh, representing that the heifers appear to be struggling relative to the older cows in our uh, AMS units. And I think that's led and challenged a lot of producers to think about ways to get heifers more used to uh, using the robot. And you can see here the construction of a sort of dummy robot here. So you can uh, see that cows could have uh, get used to using that uh, area during the heifer rearing period. And obviously some devices to help placement uh, so that they can stand comfortably uh, at the point of calving. But our friends at 4D Barn uh, really point out that uh, we use gates a lot around uh, our robot uh, milking facilities. And for the most part, when a heifer sees a gate during her rearing period, it's closed and it's telling her not to go somewhere. Um, she has to learn uh, that some gates behave differently. And these swing gates that we frequently put uh, at the entry to our robots, um, the heifer needs to learn to push against them. And so this was a setup on a heifer rearing facility to, where heifers learn just that. We close off the crossover certain days and just let them push against this swing gate here so that they just learn uh, that that's something that they can do. We need smart heifers uh, in these facilities. People are looking at uh, pair raising and group raising to build a more inquisitive, uh, uh, more uh, uh, deeper learning heifers. Uh, that may well help us. Uh, but just giving the heifers these experiences during the rearing period, uh, I think is incredibly important. And I do think if we can, that uh, there are some benefits of housing first lactation heifers separate from mature cows, as we do again uh, with the majority of our conventional herds. Um, and so if you do the math with the typical proportion of first lactation heifers for U.S. dairies, we're really talking about herds that are three units or above, so around 150 cow uh, milking cows. So you have to obviously be a certain size to be able to, to utilize this approach. Uh, once you have the heifers separate, then they're not competing against older multi-paris cows. You can make some adaptations to the robot entry area, perhaps improve lighting, and all those things can help that uh, heifer transition, reducing competition at the robot entry. Um, when we talk about feeding and fetching, uh, we need to be mindful that every time you fetch and uh, push that animal into the robot, uh, depending on how feed is allocated, you are driving intakes. Uh, and um, the overfeeding of concentrates in early lactation has and will always be a risk factor for ketosis and subacute rumal acidosis. And a problem that we've certainly identified in a number of AMS herds to the point where we're dealing with about 60% of the herd with ketosis. Um, so I think the paranoia level of, of you know, getting heifers used to the robot has kind of perhaps driven us to a point where uh, we're trying to use feed to get the animals to the robot. Uh, we're perhaps overfetching and actually creating ourselves some problems. And I'd certainly say, you know, we need to get the heifer used to using the robot. Um, but I would actually uh, now advise limiting fetching, uh, not to exceed two milkings per day, certainly in the first five days in milk, to avoid uh, that overfeeding and uh, that driving of ketosis issues in early lactation in these uh, situations. So I think um, this is a case of where uh, you can do too much of a good thing. And just uh, related to, to heifers and animals getting used to using these facilities, I was very much interested in how long cows were waiting to be milked uh, in AMS units, because we're told that, you know, cows can, you know, have this you know, wonderful experience where they uh, milk when they want to milk and they feed when they want to feed. Uh, but is that really true? So we did test that in a guided flow system that you can see here with cows in the commitment area. And in a free flow system, this was a side layout where we artificially created a waiting area, which was from the uh, fetch box here all the way to the front of the, the robot. And so we timed cows when they entered this waiting area uh, when they showed intent to uh, use the robot. So on the guided flow, we had the gate data. It was pretty simple to look at. So how long did cows wait? Well, they waited on average one hour, 24 minutes, which looks pretty good compared to a 3x milking conventional herd. Typical waiting times uh, are around uh, two, two and a half hours a day. So it's a little better than that. 
But in a conventional herd, there's always a finite time and there's a last cow milked. And uh, uh, if you don't have an alert system uh, telling you that a cow has entered that uh, commitment area and that she's waiting to be milked, um, you can have animals, uh, as example here, seven hours, 45 minutes of, of waiting to uh, access the robot per day in this individual and several cows over three, three and a half hours. So it's the tail that's the concern in an AMS unit. The average looks pretty good. There are cows that really uh, know how to work these systems that spend very, very little time at all waiting uh, in an AMS unit. But there's a group of cows at the back end that are struggling. And those are the ones that are trying to compete with others uh, and getting bullied out and need to be saved by an alert system that tells us they've been in that area for an hour or so and need to be assisted into the robot. In the free flow dairy, fascinating stuff. The average was actually exactly the same. So the average cow in a free flow AMS uh, in this study averaged one hour, 26 minutes, which was two minutes longer than the guided flow system, but had the same issue. You know, cows down here doing terrific, cows up here, one example here, five hours, 22 minutes, cows really struggling at the back end here. And this is a worse situation because you don't even know these animals are waiting. So we can solve the guided flow with alerts. Um, there is no gate telling us that these animals are waited in a free, uh, waiting in a free flow system. This, this is solved by design uh, and knowing what's going on. And what was happening in this herd was that we were dealing with a mixed parity group where the heifers were with the older cows. We saw uh, longer waiting times in the first lactation heifers, especially early on. Um, where we saw uh, those individuals waiting uh, really a prolonged period of time. So here's a, a first lactation heifer, cow 69. This herd operates with the fetch pen open when it's not in use. And you can see this tilt gate uh, that allows access to the robot from one side and the other side. Uh, and um, again, you can see these cows positioning themselves to gain access to the robot. And the fault with this design is that the pivot point is just far too far too close to the to the robot and the cows these dominant cows here can get in front of our timid little heifer here and dominate their way into the robot and keep put, and it just keeps pushing her back and back and frustrating her and she'll get to the point where you think oh man she's just perfectly placed to to get milked uh, here here she is she's got her shoulders in the right place she's going to get in the robot for sure this time and then a big old boss cow comes in and just shoves her back. How can you solve that? Well, you solve it with design. And uh, this is an example farm that did just that. So instead of having the tilt gate, you see the tilt gate here, right next to the robot entry, you put a little four or five foot uh, fence up to protect the shoulder and the front end of the cow that's waiting. And if you do that, then uh, you have a nice timid cow waiting to use the robot and a big old miserable boss cow like this one comes along and tries to push her out of the way. And as much as she might try, uh, she just cannot uh, move that animal out of the way. Sorry, that video glitched, so we'll play it again. So here's our waiting cow. Here's our boss cow. She tries from one direction. This is a semi-guided or hybrid flow. So now she's gone through the finger gates here. Now she's locked in here, but she can't move that animal out of the way because she doesn't have access to her shoulder uh, to be able to barge her out of the way. So our timid cow will get access to that robot. And there she goes. Well, let's get into that a little bit. Functional gating and design around the robot to minimize labor. Because really, the bottom line is when a lot of our producers are choosing AMS facilities to minimize the uh, labor. And so we collected some information on just that for all herds and then just comparing uh, free flow with guided flow here, just to give you some comparison. So when we include calves, because feeding the wet calves uh, has been included in other studies, which we wanted to compare, uh, one by our friends at 4D Barn, uh, we averaged around uh, three and a half to four minutes uh, of time per cow per day in performing uh, robot chores, uh, basically managing the farm. And it was a little longer, it was about half a minute longer per cow per day uh, in the free flow versus the guided flow. And relative to that, we saw 
when we look at cows per FTE. And here we did exclude cows so we can compare with data that we have from conventional herds. On average, about 170 cows per full-time equivalent worker, which is a, a 50 hour a week worker, uh, more cows per worker in our guided flow uh, than our free flow. Um, but all of those compare very favorably with the typical sort of 50 to 60 cows per FTE that we see in our conventional herds. So these herds do look uh, very good in terms of labor efficiency, but within them, we do see uh, an advantage in terms of uh, less sort of time spent working and less workforce in the guided flow versus the free flow, which we sort of suggested early on as we looked at those pros and cons. Where that time is going as we compare guided flow and free flow, free in the blue, guided in the red, uh, moving and fetching, which again, we knew more time spent in the free flow system, but also in the robot room, they're spending a little more time uh, cleaning and doing some things in the robot room that we were wanting to investigate further. When we look at labor time, and here again, we're excluding calves uh, and looking against milk production. So the blue line is milk production from the lowest milking herd to the highest milking herd. Uh, we're putting labor across here. And as our friends at 4D Barn showed, there is no relationship between the time you spend working on the farm and the milk that you get. Uh, we have efficient and inefficient farms across the board, such as the trend line here, uh, in terms of the, the time we're spending is averaging around three minutes per cow per day, about a minute less than when we include uh, calves. So the line is around three. You can see it's flat across there. There are herds spending over eight minutes uh, per cow per day. There are herds down as little as one uh, minute that basically didn't do any fetching at all. Um, so you, you need to find a balance, obviously, to manage the herd correctly. Uh, but fascinating to see the sort of variation in the time that people are spending uh, working in these herds. We did see a, a leveling off, uh, an efficiency point perhaps, uh, where the, uh, um, as herds get to around 200 cows, uh, we see improvements in efficiency to a point when then it kind of levels off thereafter. Whether it actually goes back up again when the herds get really big, uh, that would be a, a question for another day. Our max herd size was just around 480 cows. So we didn't visit the 1,000, 2,000 cow robots uh, that, uh, that are, are in existence now. So um, work for another day. But certainly in terms of efficiencies, we're thinking, a uh, single person needs to be able to move cows around. That, in, uh, that involves proper gating design, uh, that uh, it's efficient to put the robots in the same area rather than have multiple robot rooms scattered around the barn so you can get your chores done quickly. We like uh, the maintenance and management of 24-7 access to the robot for fresh cows so we don't have to spend time moving them, uh, less time for fetching and moving and so on. Minimizing fetching frequencies really to a sort of two periods of the day, timed preferably when we see actually low activity around the robot, not high activity. Um, minimizing those areas that need to be manually scraped for manure. And again, those four robot 200 cow dairies seem to be a sort of sweet spot in terms of efficiencies. And again, our friends at 4D Barn really have uh, shown, uh, shown us the, the benefits of primitive feeding versus drive-through feeding, which is what we're used to in, uh, in robot design, where we can put the robots together, uh, have one uh, separation area, one management area, rather than duplicating those areas, uh, creating efficiencies uh, in terms of labor and design. And this is one of these wonderful little um, gating diagrams that uh, our friend Yoni Pitkaranta puts together, really emphasizing thinking about how you move cows around these uh, uh, facilities to a lame cow pen to get them into the fetch pen, into the robot and back again, uh, into a chute, into a foot bath, into a separation area and so on. Really thinking about that before you start to build these facilities. With that, uh, alleyways are incredibly important uh, in these designs to help reduce uh, the stress of moving animals around and reduce the time of fetching. These are the highways that cows use to get to the robot. Uh, good, comfortable stalls will help facilitate that moment uh, movement because the cows won't all be standing there all the time. So all that's important. And we've added uh, to our conventional herd uh, recommendations 
realizing that we need uh, slightly uh, wider alleyways within AMS unit designs than we've typically uh, uh, used in conventional herds and really emphasizing that area directly in front of the robot, making sure that we've got a good clean area, at least 20 feet for cows to readily access the robot without a lot of competition. And again, this is a beautiful dairy we visited in Finland uh, using this herringbone design, which really opens up the access point here points the cows towards the feed bunk. And this is always busy throughout the day. The cows just leave the robots, start eating there. But this emphasizes this nice clear area in front of the robots. The cows don't have to compete each other as they wait to use uh, these uh, robots. So that's our, our list of uh, our blueprint to, uh, for successful AMS design. And it really points you towards, as you look at these different options, one option that, uh, that, that says yes to most of these facets of design, and that is that toll booth uh, recommendation. Uh, it gives you that flexibility of traffic systems. Uh, it allows you to have um, a separate fresh group. Uh, it allows you to extend the bunk space, sort cows through a foot bath, and uh, uh, separate cows uh, um, uh, from the, the, the waiting cows as they leave the robot so you don't create a log jam. And that's what we see in this picture here. Um, uh, cows are waiting to be milked here. They uh, attend the, the, the toll booth uh, and then exit uh, from the rear before rejoining the, the main pen from around the backside. Uh, it's adaptable to free and guided flow. This one's a free flow system with a, a fetch pen located here, but we could certainly operate it as a guided flow. You can see a cow waiting here. She's coming from the fresh pen uh, into this end robot and she has access to the robot through this tilt gate here. And again, she can be sorted back into that pen uh, so that it doesn't need a person to help uh, do that. There are some obviously cons of these uh, arrangements, uh, making sure that this lane is appropriately uh, sized. So uh, typically 40, 41 inches wide to make sure they don't turn around and we can have some non-return gates to keep uh, pushing the cows in the same direction. Uh, we're traversing scrape alleys, so there's some expense in creating these walkways and uh, developing clean and safe access for uh, the robot rooms. Uh, and of course, with uh, a lot of these barns, they, this does block uh, airflow for a tunnel ventilation system. And we would certainly prefer with these designs, the use of cross ventilation. And they are pretty good for retrofits as well. So we've got a few of these six row barns scattered around Wisconsin. And uh, one of the uh, nice solutions is to build the toll booth on the end of the, uh, the pen here. Uh, yes, you still have to stay with the drive through feeding, but you can uh, adapt this approach to existing uh, facilities quite well. So with that, Annie, this is our website. We appreciate uh, all the help that uh, you guys have given us and uh, invite you to uh, visit our site, look out for our future workshops, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Cook, for that great presentation. We do have a few questions that have came through. Um, so the first one is asking, is there still more milk in a free flow on an energy corrected milk basis? I have heard that free flow systems can have a propensity towards a lower fat test. Uh, good question. I, 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 we did not get components in our, uh, in our survey, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, but uh, certainly the, um, the, uh, the cost of that milk really needs to be looked at. Is it, uh, is it worth uh, the extra feeding? And uh, is the, are there difference in components that, um, uh, that negate the, the benefit of uh, the free flow of a guided flow that, we, uh, that we've, we've seen there? So I don't know the answer to that question is a really good question, but it's something we're certainly going to be playing with in terms of the, uh, the cost of the TMR versus the cost of the pellet and so on uh, to examine that uh, trend. Okay, and also along that lines, um, what would be the optimal amount of pellets offered to cows in the robot? Uh, again, uh, you know, not going to go into into that sort of feeding level too much, but I would point you towards the um, paper by Alex Bach and Victor Cabrera where they really examine concentrate allowances in uh, AMS units, excellent paper, that really points towards a sort of ceiling of around four kilos a day or just under nine pounds a day. 
and uh, not wanting to exceed that um, uh, and uh, you know creating a good case for for that in terms of uh, you know potential for wastage and then optimizing the energy density of the ration and intakes of the of the TMR. Um, so I'd certainly point you towards that. I, I can tell you that uh, a large proportion of our dairies feed way in excess of that. Okay, also along the lines of feeding, um, what do you think about automatic feeding in AMS? Um, uh, feeding outside of the, the robot? On the, on I, the I'm assuming this is talking about automatic um, feed pushers or mixers. Uh, the, yeah, okay. Um, if we're talking about the sort of uh, vector, um, you know, the, the automated uh, mixer, again, it, it, I've seen it in Germany, I've seen it a uh, couple of examples we had in our survey. Um, uh, it's a work in progress. You know, I think if you're dealing with herds of the, the size that we're dealing with, you know, 200 cow average, um, it's um, not quite there for, for that size dairy for smaller uh, for small enterprises, maybe, but uh, certainly uh, it would be one where the, the folks that are interested in that are work, you know, working heavily on that technology. It seemed to me when I saw it in operation, there was an awful lot of work moving the feed to the barn that where the vector had to pick the feed up and then mix it because it was mixing such small volumes that it would not be scalable for me at this, at this time, but uh, certainly on a smaller dairy, perhaps. Um, another question. So other than obvious transition cow issues and heifer training, is there a really a need or a reason to have fresh cows in a separate group since the feeding rates and the special transition pallets can be customized for individual cows? Yeah, competition. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're putting uh, animals that are the most immune compromised uh, that are getting uh, used to the start of their lactation uh, in a, in a uh, in a group with uh, older mature cows uh, that are that have been there that are through the transition um, that uh, um, you're you you know for all of the reasons that we've put uh, fresh cows uh, in uh, a fresh pen uh, that's I would continue to do that and advise to do that in a, in an AMS unit and I think uh, our our Friends at 4D Barn have really learned that in the European dairies where it's very unusual to see that. They've been big proponents of, uh, of those, um, uh, they call them very important cow, uh, VIC pens. Uh, it's one of their trademarks and the herds that are using them have been highly successful. Thank you. Um, another question, what do you think about group changing or should there be no changing or a con constant herd? Um, we, we would certainly favor situations where you where you do limit the the number of moves, but obviously again we're proponents of that fresh cow group where we have to make a move from that group to the uh, to the lactating cow group. Um, uh, certainly, in a in, when you're designing an AMS facility, uh, once the animal is in the pen uh, for the majority of lactation, I would not want to be moving her into another pen. Uh, so the vast majority of lactation is spent in uh, in one stable group. That would that would be something that we are proponents of for conventional herds and for AMS units. Okay. Um, what do you think about getting all of the cows to the foot bath while the robot is cleaning itself? Um, you know, uh, we've seen a lot of, um, you know, foot baths put in crossovers, you know, that's where the default is for these crossways and L shapes. Um, what we see is those foot baths are not used the way that uh, uh, they are supposed to. So uh, the, the logic is, oh, on bedding day, you have to move the cows between the alleyways. And so you can push the cows with the foot bath at that time. Well, you know, we've got a, a lot of years of putting foot baths in heifer pens in crossovers and they are pristine because they're never used because it's an absolute rodeo pushing cows through a right angled turn uh, into a uh, into a foot bath they don't like it um, and things that are hard tend not to be done certainly the one of the herds that we videoed um, yeah they claim that they use the foot bath on uh, on bedding day and uh, what we saw in the video was that they looked at it and said nah we'll just leave the crossover open and so they skipped foot bathing we see very few dairies foot bathing 
uh, three or four uh, times a week uh, in AMS units right now. So the foot bath frequency is, is, is pretty low. And uh, while we don't have a lot of really good information on lesion types in AMS units, you know, we're seeing that 25% lameness. Uh, the information I do have would point towards infectious hoof disease being a significant component uh, of that. And it's certainly been so in the herds that we've troubleshooted uh, and tried to develop uh, infectious hoof disease control programs around that. So. Perfect. Well, I think um, that about wraps it up for questions that we had today. 